So again, the question of why there's a hatchery in the state, um, Fairbanks in particular, um, there are other hatcheries in the state. Tonight I'll just be focusing on the hatchery we have here in Fairbanks. Um, if people have other questions, there's uh, online resources through the Fish and Game Department's website that uh, will tell you lots about other um, hatchery programs that exist in the state. Um, so for us up here in, in Fairbanks in the interior, um, the sport fishing enhancement programs provide three main benefits to anglers. The first one is opportunity. Um, there's a lot of fishing resources in the state, but not a lot of them are accessible. So hatchery programs offer uh, fish that are available on primarily roadside fisheries. That's the, the bread and butter of our programs are providing fish in areas that otherwise wouldn't have fish or wouldn't be accessible. Um, the second part of our program is diversity. Um, again, lots of resources out there, but what you can get to is often the same. Um, the interior is a great example. There's a lot of fishing opportunities, but primarily for sport fishing, um, it's Arctic grayling. They're fun to catch, but a lot of anglers want a little more diversity than a single species. Um, so within the enhancement program, we offer five different species right now, so anglers have diversity in their experiences there. Um, along with that comes drawing pressure away from wild stocks, such as Chena River um, grayling that are uh, currently managed as a catch and release only. We stock um, Arctic grayling as an example, so people have um, an opportunity to go out and harvest those fish, um, target those fish, and it doesn't impact the wild stock. Um, if you focused all the angling pressure on our limited wild stocks that are, have limited accessibility, those could get easily overexploited and have issues. What's the yellow stuff in the picture? Um, that is a, a, a six-wheeler, um, and we're stocking fish into a lake there. Um, that's part of the, uh, the diversity and opportunity as well. Um, is a diversity of angling experience. So not everybody wants to fish at a very popular roadside fishery such as Birch Lake, Quartz Lake, or something like that that is popular. You're gonna have lots of other boats out there with you. Um, so we do have a small segment of our population that is geared towards a, remote, a more remote fishery um, to provide that diversity of experience. Um, so you can have opportunities to go out and potentially have a lake all to yourself to enjoy um, a weekend's fishing that's, that's quiet and secluded. Um, Within our program, our main uh, guiding document that we use that kind of outlines a lot of what we do, um, in fact, all of what we do, is what we call the statewide stocking plan. It has all our enhancement policies, so the, the rules and regulations that are in place that guide our activities. Um, it's a five-year plan. It lays out for the next five years what our anticipated stocking locations, species, and numbers are. Um, and part of this that makes this document pretty special is it's an annually publicly reviewed document. So every year um, the public has a chance to comment on our activities, propose new locations, different species, they wanna see something done differently. Um, they have that opportunity every year to comment on this plan. Um, so this really guides a lot of what we do and is our kind of um, direction and, and how we do things. If people are interested in commenting, um, the next year's plan usually is released in um, mid to late November, um, and we usually have about a four to six week comment period, and then the plan is finalized and released in late um, January. Um, another question that gets brought up a lot, and I'll just cover right off the bat here, is funding, how we're funded. Um, it's particularly a, a hot button topic these days with the, the state and in its condition. Um, all of our funding is driven through the Federal Aid for Sport Fish Restoration Act. Um, this is a federal um, excise tax on things like fishing gear, motorboat fuel, um, and other um, sport fishing related items. It's collected nationally, um, and it's di distributed to all 50 states via a kind of calculation that depends on fishing license sales and land area. Uh, Alaska, because of that land area calculation, is what's considered a max state. Um, it's limited by law of, of how much any one state can collect out of this fund at one time. Um, and we are one of those max states, so we get 5% of the, the total funding for that year um, from that program comes to Alaska. Um, we interact with that funding by um, matching it. It's a three to one matching grant. Um, so the state will provide the one and the, the federal um, program provides the other three parts to that. Um, the state uses sport fishing license sales to match that grant. 
So basically the, the end result to all of this is that the Alaska sport fish hatcheries are entirely angler funded. Um, and we leverage a lot of federal funding um, to make our programs successful. Um, we'll go back a little bit. This is um, just kind of a little history lesson of, of how we ended up with a, uh, a hatchery in Fairbanks. Um, before the one was constructed here, there were two hatcheries that were, were providing all the sport fishing um, products for interior and south central. Um, they both relied on military power plants to supply heated water to them, um, but the military shut those plants down with the last one closing in 2005. Um, this eliminated our ability to produce um, uh, what we call a catchable size fish, or that's a fish anywhere from seven to 10 inches long, um, and is the, the bulk of our product that we release in Fairbanks. Um, so we built two new hatcheries. Um, the goal was to return hatchery production to historic levels as well as build for the future and add um, capability for future needs. The end result is that two new hatcheries were constructed by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. One is called the William Jack Hernandez Sportfish Hatchery in Anchorage, and then we have the Ruth Burnett Sportfish Hatchery here in Fairbanks. Um, this kind of demonstrates the need and the impacts of that loss of heat. Um, the upper graph um, is just sheer numbers of fish that were stocked. You can see the decline starting um, 2010, 11, and 12. Um, we really weren't able to produce many fish at all. Um, also, you see on the, the bottom graph, that's uh, simply a, a measure of how much um, biomass or number of pounds of fish we stocked. Um, and there's the large decline after 2003 um, with that loss of heat, and that reflects that loss of that catchable production. <coughs> The first thing that you need to consider when building a hatchery is your water source. Obviously, we're raising fish, so that becomes the primary um, focus point. Um, when we set out to build the, the hatchery up here, there were obviously two options. Um, we're sited right next to the Chena River, so we were looking at that, but there's also a lot of groundwater um, in Fairbanks. Um, ultimately, we went with the groundwater option. Um, the Chena River has existing fish populations, and that water supply is susceptible to contamination. Um, because it has existing fish populations in it, that water could contain pathogens um, that could infect the hatchery fish as well. Um, when we drilled the wells and into the groundwater, it's a, a confined aquifer, so it's not susceptible to surface impacts at all, and is considered pathogen-free. Um, the downside, much like everywhere else in Fairbanks, is there's a lot of water, but it's got a lot of iron and a lot of manganese in it. Um, so we did know that we would have to filter those out before we could be used in the, in the hatchery. Um, likewise, if we use surface water, it too would have to be filtered and sterilized. Um, so there is a treatment that would be required no matter which source we went to. Um, another downside to using surface water is there's a high variability in annual water quality. So spring runoff has lots of sediment. Um, it changes drastically between winter and summer flows. Um, the groundwater is very stable in both temperature and um, the iron and manganese levels. So you can design filtration for a constant rather than a variable uh, water quality. Um, the, the Chena River also varies seasonally with um, its temperature. So we would both at certain times of the year have to heat the water as well as cool the water. It gets too warm in the summertime often um, for our programs. So we would have had to have equipment for both. And then finally, um, the Chena River obviously in the wintertime could be obstructed with ice or other debris um, and cause issues with the water intake. So the, uh, the Ruth Burnett Hatchery exists solely on well water for uh, our production. Um, the pictures are just a uh, a picture of the wellhead, it's pretty tough to take a picture of a well, there's not a lot to see there, um, but that's, that's a picture of the wellhead. Um, the picture below, for those that are interested, um, is an external parasite, it's called Gyrodactylus, um, and it's a common fish pathogen um, that's found in surface waters throughout um, and kind of adhere to the external side, so we like to avoid those um, if possible. Where is the well? The wells are on site, um, so they're both located on site. Um, so once we decided what water we were going to use, we had to determine what style of hatchery we were going to build. And this is where we start to, to deviate from your standard hatchery model that you see elsewhere in the state. Um, other hatcheries and what we came from were considered traditional raceways. Um, 
You can see on the picture on the left, they're the long linear concrete raceways typically. Um, they've been used for a lot of years, but they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. They, they require large volumes of water. Um, so if you're having to treat heat and filter water, that's kind of a downside. The other option that was out there is called recirculating aquaculture, and it reuses a large portion of the water. It uses 85 to 90% less water to produce the same amount of fish. Um, obviously, there's a density issue when you do that. If you're using traditional raceway models, you have to rear fish at much lower densities, where with the recirculating aquaculture, you can raise them at high densities. Um, this impacts your, um, not only the amount of equipment that you have, but if you can locate it inside or outside. I don't know of any traditional raceway style hatcheries that are located inside a building where there are lots of recirculating aquaculture systems that are located entirely inside a building. Fairbanks, Alaska, being inside has its advantages in the, in the wintertime. Um, without, without being able to close the facility, we probably couldn't operate um, a hatchery in, in here as an external facility. Um, the other side is if you're trying to reuse water and you're trying to save that water because you invested in it, um, the raceway systems are not very good at reusing water. They're, the more you reuse it, their water quality just gets degraded and degraded and degraded. Um, and pretty soon the, the rearing conditions within those systems uh, are less than optimal. Your fish growth declines, things like that. With, uh, with RAS, your fil there's filtration systems built into it, um, so you maintain a constant optimal water quality. And it's all deals with controlled as well. Outside raceways, you have less control over your environment, your water quality, things like that. With the inside, you have a lot more uh, control over that. It's tightly controlled and monitored, so we can maintain optimal fish growth um, to provide the better product and more economically the better product. Speaking of products, um, we have kind of three classes of fish that we produce in the hatchery and use within our um, sport fishing enhancement programs. Um, the first size is a, a fingerling or subcatchable. These fish are anywhere from two to four inches long. Um, and we produce these for rainbow trout, Arctic char, coho salmon, and Arctic grayling. We primarily use fingerling in remote lakes. We can transport, you saw the previous picture of an ATV dumping fish in. We can move a lot more fish that are smaller than if we're trying to transport larger fish. Um, they're primarily used in lakes that have lower pressure, um, so those fish um, can grow and provide adequate angling opportunity um, with smaller fish. They do have a lower cost to produce, but there's also a lower survival when you look at return to the angler and, and what you're actually getting for your fish. So they're, they cost significantly less, but there's not an immediate return. The other uh, product that we do are what we call a catchable. Um, this is, these fish are stocked anywhere from eight to 10 inches long. Um, and right now we produce rainbow trout, Arctic char, Chinook salmon, and Arctic grayling. Um, most of these are used in your roadside, what we call a put and take fishery, where we put in the number of fish that we think anglers are gonna harvest or take out um, during that year. Um, the, the downside is they are higher cost, but they are immediately available to an angler and we can create that fishery or increase, decrease stocking levels and have an immediate impact. If you're using fingerling to do that, um, it's a two to three year process before you can change the amount of fish that go into a lake. So um, we use both products uh, kind of simultaneously um, during the year and just target different lakes with it. Um, we do have one, I guess the, the one little oddball is the subcatchables. Um, we do those for Arctic char, um, and they're a fall release, and they're just a, a slightly bigger um, fish, and those are just used in a handful of lakes. It's not a major part of our program, but it is one size that we release. Um, so trying to produce all those, what we ended up with a production design with the hatchery, um, and then you can see this on the right is the, an overview of, of what the inside of the Ruth Burnett hatchery looks like. Um, Overall, we're about 46,000 square feet in size. Um, it holds eight 30-foot diameter tanks. They're 30 feet by um, 10 feet deep. Um, it holds 20 10-foot tanks, and those are 10-foot in diameter by four feet deep. And then it has four smaller five-foot diameter tanks that are only about three feet deep. Its design capacity was to produce about 250,000 catchable size fish a year. 
and uh, have the potential to produce 735,000 fingerlings should they be needed. Um, like I said, the hatchery did get designed as a recirculating aquaculture facility, so we can use any combinations of flow through, that's just simply water in, water out. Um, partial reuse, that's where we reuse up to 75% of the water, or full recirculation technologies where we can reuse 95 to 97% of the water in each system. Um, so that's kind of the history of how we got to where we are. Um, that was uh, the first Arctic char eggs were brought into the facility in January uh, 2012. We've been operational ever since then. Um, since 2013, almost all of the fish uh, released within um, Region 3, which includes Fairbanks, Glenalla, and Delta, um, have come from the Ruth Burnett hatchery here in Fairbanks. Um, and right now our current production levels are meeting all management requests for the five species we, we produce. So the facility, um, there's still some people that aren't aware of that we're operating, um, but we're operating and, and doing quite well with it. Um, describe the picture so you know what you're looking at. Um, picture on the, the upper picture was the first uh, Arctic char eggs that we received. Um, and the lower picture is some uh, uh, about two week old Arctic grayling. Um, so kind of see what they look like. Um, as I mentioned before, when we talk about water sources, um, and this is part of the, uh, the hatchery that we operate, is uh, an iron and manganese removal system. Um, so if we didn't remove that from the groundwater, it forms particulate, and that particulate gets embedded in the fish gills and can, um, can be lethal. Um, so it has to be removed. <coughs> Excuse me. To do that, we use a two-stage filtration, um, and that removes iron, manganese, and then hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is that kind of rotten, eggy smell you get out of groundwater. Um, it's also very toxic to fish, even in small doses, so that's removed in our filtration system as well. We're a little bit novel. Um, this is one of the, the solutions that we came up with um, to make this facility function the way it does is we actually use iron oxidizing bacteria in our first stage filtration system. Um, it's very different than traditional um, drinking water systems in that most of them hit chlorine up front. You're actually trying to discourage bacteria from growing. We found, because we're not a drinking water plant, that those bacteria were actually very beneficial to us um, and allow us to filter this water without the addition of chlorine um, to oxidize iron and manganese. The second stage is where we primarily target the manganese removal, um, and we also do the final polishing step on um, the iron. Um, all of this results in water that uh, we put a design limit of 0.1 parts per million. Um, to give people a reference, a drinking water standard is actually 0.3 parts per million. So we're significantly less than drinking water. We did do studies. Um, she mentioned the pilot hatchery work that I started out with. That was one of the things that we looked at is what level of iron do we need to, to do to raise fish in a healthy manner um, and determine these levels. Our operational um, limits right now are significantly less than that. Um, usually we're about 0.03 to 0.04 um, parts per million of iron. So we're, the, the treatment system works quite well. Um, Post-filtration, the water is heated. Um, fish growth within their biologic range is driven primarily by temperature and food. So as long as you provide um, enough food, they will grow and grow faster with warmer temperatures. Um, because of the five species, each species has its own requirements and um, target sizes and target dates for release. Um, so each rearing module within the hatchery has its own hot and cold um, line so that we can blend and have independent temperature control throughout the facility. The final step with um, groundwater is that it often contains high levels of dissolved gases. Um, the, the groundwater here has that as well. So it has um, dissolved carbon dioxide and actually dissolved nitrogen um, that is in that water as well. Um, we remove that with um, what's called a stripping column. It's just a forced aeration that blows the carbon dioxide off the water. And then it's uh, injected into what's called a, um, a vacuum degasser, and it, and it puts water into a vacuum chamber, and that pulls out the nitrogen. 
So just like a diver would get the bends if they have, are exposed to nitrogen supersaturation, um, fish would get the same thing and they can actually develop um, gas embolisms in their skin, gills, um, tissues. So it's important for us to remove that as well. Um, part of keeping a, a healthy population is um, the first step of where your fish come from. Um, so for our facility, all the fish that enter the facility start their production cycle as an egg. Um, the reason we do that is we can actually disinfect the outside of an egg um, and ensure that we're not bringing in any sort of um, bacteria or viruses in with those eggs. Um, once they hatch out, you can't disinfect the outside of a um, developed uh, fish. Um, to get our eggs, um, we have two um, primary means of, of shipping eggs into the facility and starting that way. Um, the first are um, captive brood stocks that are held in Anchorage for rainbow trout and Arctic char. Um, the rainbows are held for uh, three years and then they're spawned and used for egg production. Right now, Fish and Game's annual egg production for rainbow trout is about three and a half to four million eggs a year. Um, and because of that large number, um, that's the reason we have a captive brood is there isn't a wild source out there that could provide that number of eggs on an annual basis. Um, for the Arctic char, it's a significantly smaller program. Um, I think we usually end up taking about 200,000 eggs a year. Um, the reason we have a captive brood for that is all the available Arctic char sources are logistically fairly difficult to get to. Um, up until about 2002, I believe, um, we used to go get eggs from captive Arctic char out on the, uh, um, out by Dillingham, um, but their availability was really limited. It was hard to time it and logistics of getting eggs safely out of there um, became an issue and very expensive. So the decision was made to bring uh, the char into um, a hatchery as a captive broodstock. Um, all these eggs, like I said, are taken in Anchorage and then they're shipped up. Um, to us here in Fairbanks when they reach what's called an eyed stage. So the, the embryo has developed its eyes um, and they become less susceptible to any physical shocks. Um, so we actually load them up on Gold Streak um, and fly them up uh, twice a year. Um, so they, they arrive on an airplane to us up here. Do they, do they get mileage? I, you know, I, I wish I could put their mileage on my mileage account. <laughs> yes? Do you ever introduce genetic diversity into those or the base stock or rainbows? Um, we have not. Um, they are managed in conjunction with our genetics department for genetic diversity within the, um, the captive brood itself, um, but we have not supplemented that brood stock since it was brought into the facility. So the sperm is from brood stock also? Yes. Um, the other source are wild egg takes. Um, we do three wild egg takes up here in Fairbanks to support our programs. Um, the first one is Arctic grayling. Um, the broodstock comes from the Chena River. Those fish are live spawned, so we're actually able to take um, mature adults out of the river when they're spawning. Um, we'll remove the eggs and the, the milt from the fish, um, and then those fish are released alive back into the Chena River. Our Chinook salmon also come from the Chena River currently. Um, we've used two brood sources there in the past. Right now we're using the Chena River because logistically it's much easier for us. We have used the Salter River strain in the past as well. Um, these fish are collected in July. We actually um, just did our egg take today um, for this year's um, egg take um, for the Chinook. And then for the Coho, we get those down in the Delta Clearwater River um, and those are taken in um, early October um, is when we take those fish. Um, the king egg take is on the left, um, so obviously significantly larger fish. Um, the egg take on the right for coho. Um, that was a no notable year. It was, we rolled into Delta Junction and it was, um, I think about 10 below zero. It was one of those lovely cold October. So that was a notable, memorable egg take for all of us there. Um, right now we spawn um, 10 pair of Chinook. Um, so it's very small. Um, coho varies a little bit annually. It's anywhere from 18 to about 26 to 27 pairs. And grayling, we spawn about 40 pairs. Um, we also provide um, grayling eggs to Anchorage for their programs down there. 
Once the eggs are taken, like I said, they can be disinfected, so they're brought into the hatchery, disinfected before they're moved into um, elsewhere in the facility. Um, we move them into our incubation room. Um, this room uh, specially designed for just holding those eggs. Um, they use fairly traditional technology. Um, this technology has been around since probably the 50s or early 60s. Um, they're called heath style trays or heath trays. Um, Within the hatchery, we have six different modules that can be controlled independently in terms of temperature, flow rates, things like that, um, for a total of 192 different trays. Um, each tray can hold 7,500 to 12,000 fish, depending on the species, um, which relates to egg size. Um, they're kind of fixed by volume. Um, the fish stay in, in the incubation um, anywhere from three weeks for Arctic grayling, which is the shortest duration, up to four months, which is the Chinook, and that's the longest duration. Um, you can see pictures uh, far, far left is uh, um, eyed eggs in the facility. Um, that's the, like I said, that's the stage that we can ship um, eggs back and forth. Once they hatch out, um, you have your, your alev in there in the middle. Um, so these guys just sit there with your yolk sacs and uh, uh, absorb that, and then you have um, fish that are ready to be put out in the, in the rearing tanks on the right um, that are full on fry. Um, within the facility, we move out in the production area. Um, I said the, the smallest tanks that we have are these five foot diameter tanks. Um, these are operated only as flow through, um, so it's just water in, water out. None of that water is reused. Um, they have very low flow rates and they're not, the fish aren't in those tanks very long, so it didn't warrant the capital investment for um, the, the uh, equipment to reuse the water. Um, they are only used right now for Arctic grayling and Arctic char. Um, when both species hatch out, they're very, very small compared to the other species. Um, and it makes it very difficult to work with in a larger tank. So we utilize the smaller tanks to work with the smaller fish. Um, and these, these fish are only in the tanks for about six to eight weeks and then they're transferred to another tank within the, within the facility. Um, the, next, the next size tanks that we have are the 10 foot tanks. Um, we can operate these as flow through or in a partial reuse scenario. Um, so we can reuse up to 75% of the water depending on the life stage of the fish. Um, these tanks hold about 2,200 gallons of water and are grouped in two tank modules that share a common water source. Um, their equipment is designed for the reuse, um, but it's fairly limited. Um, we can remove carbon dioxide produced by the fish through stripping columns. Um, and then we also have an LHO or a, a low head oxygenator that's combined in with that. Um, and that offers the opportunity to inject oxygen into the water to provide that to the fish for what they consume. Um, and those are actually on the upper left, the large um, aluminum um, silver columns that you see are the stacked CO2 stripper on top and LHO in the bottom. Um, these tanks are primarily used for startup of the other species, um, rainbow trout, um, coho salmon, and Chinook salmon. Um, and they are also used to produce all the fingerlings. So these fish stay in the 10 foot tanks until they're um, two to four inches long. Of course, there's always an exception to the rule. Um, we're no different. Um, our Arctic char also stay in the 10-foot tanks for their entire um, duration of their stay in the hatchery, um, even as a catchable fish. Um, we can do that because char can be raised at much higher densities, um, and it's a fairly small program, so it didn't warrant a large tank because we could produce the number of fish required in the smaller tanks. Um, so those are um, probably about five to six inch char there on the left, um, and then an overhead view of that same tank on the right with the fish in it. Um, so once fish either go out the door and get stocked in the lake as fingerling, the next stage for us within it is to transfer fish into the 30 foot tanks. Um, and these are where we grow out and produce our, our catchable sized fish. Um, the fingerling production is all done in about two to three months. Um, so that's, um, kind of a springtime, spring and fall for most species and they're out, they don't spend the winter in those 10 foot tanks with the exception of the char. Um, everything kind of winters over in these 30 foot tanks to produce the catchables. Um, because of that duration, they're in 30 foot tanks for um, anywhere from nine to 12 months. Um, it makes a lot more sense to reuse as much of the water as possible. 
So these are the full recirculating aquaculture systems. Um, they're operated at 95 to 97% water reuse. Um, each tank holds about 40,000 gallons of water, um, and that's recirculated at a rate of about 850 gallons a minute per tank is water in, water out. Um, but of that, only 30 to 40 gallons per minute is, is water we're adding. Um, so they're quite efficient. The downside to that is it does take uh, um, a large amount of filtration equipment to maintain that water reuse level. Um, this includes what are called radio flow separators. Um, what that is is basically just a giant settling chamber. Um, so your large solids that are generated within the tank settle out and can be removed from the system. Um, they also go into a microscreen drum filter. That's where your smaller solids are filtered out. Um, <clears throat> It's basically just a drum that uh, has a, a 90 micron screen around it. Water flows in and out, and all your solids are captured within the filter. Um, it has what's called a fluidized sand bed biofilter. We'll explain that in the next slide. Um, and again, another repeat of the, the carbon dioxide stripping column and low head oxygenator for um, CO2 removal and oxygen addition. Um, these also vary a little bit from the reuse tanks in that we introduce a small amount of ozone. Um, this is used as a water conditioner. It's not dosed at a level that is a disinfectant, um, but it is used to condition water. It helps remove um, the very fine solids that you can't filter out. So it gets rid of our and reduces our um, carbon content, which prevents um, fungus and bacteria from growing within the system. Uh, each of these tanks can produce um, 24 to 40,000 catchable size fish per tank. Um, that depends on the size goal of the fish and also the species. Some species um, you can raise at higher densities. Others like rainbows get very uh, defensive with each other if they get too crowded um, and your quality of fish goes in, they'll start kind of chewing on each other. Um, so they're, they're kept and managed for density. Um, and like I said, these are used exclusively for catchable production. Um, kind of the heart of this system and really what makes it tick um, is the fluidized sand bed biofilter. Um, anything over about 75% water reuse or water recirculation requires a biofilter. It's the same general idea as the ones you have in your home aquarium. Um, uh, it uses bacteria to break down ammonia that's produced by the fish. Um, the ammonia is a waste product of protein metabolism. And what this is is basically a giant petri dish that houses bacteria. Um, and those bacteria actually use the ammonia as a food source and break it down um, sequentially into a waste product that is much less toxic to fish. And the, the end result, if you were to take it long enough, would be a return to nitrogen gas. Um, is, in ours, um, even that small amount of dilution water um, removes the end products before it gets to that stage. But that's the whole called a denitrification process that happens. Um, we do, even though it's a piece of equipment, it is managed as a living organism. It has, um, it requires oxygen. Um, it doesn't like large amounts of solids. Um, so that's the, the radio flow separator, the drum filter, and the ozone also help the biofilter. Um, it consumes um, other, other aspects in the water that have to be managed and monitored. Um, so the, these systems are quite complex. It's much more than just the, the fish that are living within this system. Um, other key support equipment within the hatcheries. Um, first one, people always have a lot of questions of, well, how do you move fish in and out? Um, the picture on the upper right is what's called a fish pump. Um, it's a large six inch diameter pump um, that we can pump live fish with, um, with virtually no mortality. Um, so we can pump fish up to about 250, 300 feet um, with one of these pumps. Um, saves on staff and you don't have people carrying fish in buckets to move um, thousands of pounds of fish annually. Um, the other thing that we um, included within the facility to reduce manpower um, was automated feeders. That's the picture on the, the lower left there is a, a large hopper that we can fill with um, anywhere from a week's worth of food to sometimes only a couple days worth. Um, but it's a computer controlled um, automated feeder, so it will feed um, 24 hours a day. We don't have to have staff members spending time. Um, traditional hatch hatchery methods are one guy's just doing nothing but walking around flinging fish feed. Um, with these, um, it reduces our staffing levels. Um, 
The second one, because of the densities that we rear fish at, we have to provide supplemental oxygen. Um, simple aeration couldn't produce um, enough oxygen to keep them alive and growing. So we do have on-site oxygen generators uh, in the facility um, that provide uh, about 95% pure oxygen um, throughout the building um, that are provided to each rearing module. Um, there's a lot of equipment within the building um, between the water treatment systems, the fish rearing systems, um, just general building maintenance stuff. Um, so we have uh, a SCADA system. Um, it stands for Supervisory Command and Data Acquisition. Um, we have a large mix of manual and automated controls. Some valves are the old-fashioned method where you've got to go turn the valve. Others are done uh, um, electronically or, or even um, have programs that do it around the clock when, and require no operator input whatsoever. There's also a robust monitoring system. Um, we have a lot invested in these fish every year. We want to make sure that nothing goes wrong. Um, so there's um, sensors throughout the facility that measure temperature, flow, dissolved oxygen, pH, things like that. Um, and all go into an alarm system that um, get to call us lucky folks that are on the standby alarm 24 hours a day um, if something goes out of, uh, out of the set points um, or a, a piece of equipment fails. The other helpful thing that it does is it trends all the data from all those probes so we can go back if there is an issue or just look at long-term data trends um, and tell us how our, our programs are going, if there's problems, um, be able to backtrack that. Finally, so the fish make it through the hatchery, they're produced, they're ready to go out. People are like, all right, let's catch some fish, enough, enough equipment. Um, we use a variety of stocking methods. Um, like I said, we have a, a large diversity in lakes and, and experiences that we offer. Um, the bulk of our stocking is done with just a highway truck. Most of our lakes are highway road accessible, um, so we can get to them with a the truck. Um, you can see the, the lower two pictures are two stock, stocking trucks that we operate at the, the hatchery. Um, we also have a fair number of lakes that get stocked with an ATV, um, so they may be um, quote unquote Alaska road accessible. Um, but we can't get a stocking truck there, or they are true ATV only lakes that do require um, an off-road vehicle to get to. And then we also have um, lakes that require um, aerial stocking. So we will load fish into either a fixed wing um, airplane or a um, helicopter for some of the lakes. Um, not a lot of that is done, obviously because of the expense of stocking, but it, it, we do have about 15 different lakes that are stocked currently with aerial means. Um, some of those do require an airplane to access. Um, example is like Dune Lake out um, west of Nanana, um, that there isn't really a, an alternative access means. Others are done just for the logistics of it. Um, Alaska Highway, we use a helicopter to stock a lot of those lakes. Um, they are ATV accessible, but it's about a 12 mile ride in and our fish wouldn't survive the, the 12 miles strapped to the back of an ATV. Um, within the stocking trucks, um, we actually haul oxygen bottles um, and they have aerators on the trucks so that we can remove CO2 and add oxygen while they're hauling. When you say aerial, are you dropping them in the air or are you landing with floats and pouring them out? Good, good question. Um, we do land um, when we put fish in an airplane. The, the plane does land and they're dumped out of a tank um, with both. Um, you can actually stock fish out of an airplane that is flying um, the target elevation is about 200 feet, um, actually. And, and you can successfully stock fish that way. There's a lot of states that do it. Um, we're fortunate that we don't, our lakes are big enough that we can just put a plane um, on the lake. It's also, there's, it's a very special plane that does the, the aerial dumps. Um, so we don't, we don't have that need for a plane of that size. Um, but yeah, if you ever want to see some pretty amazing footage, YouTube, high mountain lake stocking and I think Idaho and Wyoming, they've got some pretty crazy footage. The helicopters, are you using basically a fire <coughs> um, Much smaller. Um, we we have, um, they're actually contained within the helicopter on the skids. Um, they're, we've got two um, 15 gallon tanks, I think is what we're, I think is the size for the helicopters. Mm -hmm. We used to go out of an R22, um, the guy that we, that we use um, and he's familiar with. Oh, they're using that when we're stocking. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so no, they, these are, um, they're small lakes, the, the number of fish are limited, so any sort of fire bucket would be greatly uh, more than we need. Um, while we're driving down the road, we do have monitors in the cab, so the driver's monitoring temperature and dissolved oxygen while we're traveling so we can stop and make adjustments if necessary. Um, and part of that's because we need to be really efficient when we're stocking fish. Obviously, it takes quite a bit of time. Um, we stock all the way down into McCarthy um, area lakes um, and Lake Louise Road. Um, those are uh, six to seven hours one way. Um, so it takes us a lot of time to stock fish. So we try and make every trip count. Um, so within that, just to give you guys an idea, we're hauling at about 1.7 pounds of fish per gallon of water in the trucks. So these, these fish are packed in there. They do well. Um, we're very successful at that. Um, but it does take the specialty design equipment to do that. Um, and I guess the final one is we do have a couple lakes that um, motorized access is prohibited. Um, they're on refuges. Um, so we will load up a bucket, strap it to our backs, and do the old-fashioned method of, of hike into the lake with, with the fish. Fortunately, we don't have to do a lot of that. Um, so stocking goals, again, kind of linking back to the beginning of the presentation, looking at kind of the collapse of our stocking efforts. Um, when the, when, with the loss of the waste heat. Uh, you can see this graph shows the number of catchables that we stock. Um, so that's those fish that are immediately available. You can see since 2012, um, that number's come up and we met our original goal of returning um, to peak historical levels um, and also be more consistent. So for, the, for those five years, our stocking levels are very consistent and that offers angler that opportunity to go out and know that that lake is going to be as productive this year as it was last year and hopefully the next year. Um, so that's one of the things that we've taken pride in as well. There's, there's not as much of the variability that was in past years. Um, talked about also how we, we deal a lot in thinking about more pounds of fish or biomass. Um, there's a lot of ways you can manipulate numbers. You can say you stock a lot of fish, but if they're all fingerling and they don't survive, then that's not a return to the angler. Um, we did find that in Fairbanks, um, fingerling stockings are successful in some lakes, but in general, um, the catchable stockings are much more successful in enhancing fishing opportunities. So you can see um, as we get to the right on the graph, um, the red numbers uh, show the amount of biomass or pounds of fish that were fingerling. Um, and you see that's quite high in the late and mid 90s. Um, and we've shifted our our focus to more of a catchable production and see that uh, um, we're, we're greatly increasing the amount of um, biomass that we're putting into lakes and hopefully um, do that. 2017, the very last bar um, shows a large spike. Um, it's one of the improvements that we did to the, the stocking program last year was we went to a larger rainbow trout catchable. We found we could produce, um, instead of a seven to eight inch rainbow trout, we could produce an eight to 10 inch rainbow trout and that provides anglers kind of that gets you over that break of what people were harvesting. Um, we found people didn't want to harvest a seven inch rainbow trout, but they would harvest a 10 inch rainbow trout. So we've tried to up our um, size goal to, to better accommodate that. Um, our current annual production is listed below. Um, rainbow trout, we're producing about 140,000 um, catchables every year. That goes along with 110,000 fingerling. Um, the Arctic Grayling program we brought back last year. It had been discontinued for a couple of years for budgetary reasons. Um, we were able to bring that program back. Um, and right now we're currently producing about 28,000 catchables a year and 6,000 fingerling. Our Chinook salmon program is holding steady. We do about 40,000 catchables a year. Those are released in um, late September, early October. Um, they're primarily used as an ice fishing product. Um, so they stay active um, all winter long where a lot of the other species will go um, dormant um, and not be as available to anglers for winter ice fisheries. Arctic char, we're producing about 11,000 catchables every year. Um, Subcatchables and fingerling are produced every other year. That's why I've got the little asterisk behind those. Um, that's, a, that's an every other year stocking. Um, char are very long lived compared to the other species that we stock. So a lot of the lakes that we put them into um, those fish can live year after year after year. 
things like a rainbow trout, we get at maximum about five years out of those fish before they naturally will, will die off. Um, and then, um, but the, the char we can stock less of because they will live for uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, and then we produce about 74,000 coho salmon. Um, also kind of the same idea with the Chinook and a, a winter ice fishery. So right now our annual production is, is about 444,000 fish um, every year. The other part of the, the facility that we incorporated um, was a, a, a visitor's area. Um, we, we've kind of branded it the Tanana Valley Fishery Center. It reflects um, not only the hatchery's involvement in the local um, fisheries and things like that, but it also offers opportunity for the department to include other educational um, uh, programs within the hatchery to expand that knowledge. Um, kind of the showpiece of this facility is um, a 5,000 gallon aquarium. Um, it's pretty cool. It's, a, it's about 10 feet in diameter by oh, eight or nine feet tall. Um, we currently have all species of fish that we culture within it. Um, we've had it going for about three years now. Um, it's pretty, pretty neat to see. Um, we've also developed a historical exhibit um, within, within the fishery center. Um, actually the first sport fish hatchery in the state was at Birch Lake. Um, most people think it originated down in Anchorage or something like that, but the actual sport fish, the first sport fish hatchery in the state was um, housed at Birch Lake, um, operated between 1952 and 1963, I believe. Um, we also have a, an operations video, so you can come in and see um, us doing our activities that are you know, maybe once a year or twice a year, um, and explains the whole process, kind of like what I've done here, but um, in a video we have playing there. Um, currently, we've got this, um, the Tana Valley Fishery Center, it's uh, staffed May through August. Um, so we've got somebody in there that's available to handle questions, greet visitors, um, hand out resources, things like that. Um, and they're there Tuesday through Saturday. Um, the rest of the year we're open, but it is unstaffed. Um, and that's open just Monday through Friday. Um, both parts of the year are just business hours. Um, and we are continuing to, to plan and develop this space. Um, it was not funded during construction. It has been something post-construction that we've worked to develop the interpretive side um, and more of the public outreach. But I encourage people if they want to come by and everything else, it's a great, uh, great way to see the hatchery and, and everything else. Um, in addition to the aquarium, we have a large, um, the, there's a large wall of windows that look into the, into the facility so you can see um, the whole inner workings of the hatchery um, firsthand. So, Enough talk, where do I go fishing, right? That's what people want to know. Um, our, our number one resource right now is what we call the Alaska Lake Database. It's accessed through the Fish and Game website. Um, within this, it, it's a pretty, pretty nice resource for, for us and for anglers. Um, every lake that we stock and even lakes that we have stocked in the past or um, done any sort of work on is listed within this database. Um, and so there's things like our stocking levels, how many fish went into that lake, when, what size were they. But if they're natural fish in the lake, they're also gonna tell you that as well. Um, there's links to um, pictures and um, access directions so you can see um, what the lake looks like before you get there um, so you know what to expect and how to get there. Um, we link what are called bathymetric maps so you can see what the underwater topography looks like in the lake to help you to figure out where to catch fish. If you're looking for a ridge line or a point or a drop off, um, this can help you find those points. Um, and sample data. So if we've gone out there and we've evaluated the lake, um, which we do periodically, um, biologists will go out and sample a lake to determine how well the fish are growing, if our stocking levels are meeting the angler demand, things like that. That data all gets funneled through this portal as well. And so you have ac that access as an angler. So you can see, you know, does this lake have really big fish in it? Are they growing? Um, does it have a lot of fish in it? Is it just a few fish? So you can kind of target where you want to go. Um, it's all based on a Google Earth interface, so you can see kind of general areas of where we are and what they are. Um, so if people are interested in uh, where to fish the stock waters, um, this is a really powerful tool. The other thing that's out there for anglers that you can do and we offer are little printed booklets. Um, you can get them at the College Road Fish and Game Office or we have them at the Tana Valley Fishery Center as well and they're a printed listing with directions and maps of all of our stocked waters. 
Um, we put a lot of effort into growing fish all year round, and um, we do that so that people have fish to catch, so we want to facilitate that the best way we can. Um, I make a, an effort to make sure that anytime we've stocked a lake, that data is available within 48 hours of us being at the lake. So it's, people have that ability to know if a lake's been stocked or not, um, and, uh, and be able to target their, their effort accordingly. Um, I think that's what I have on questions. Um, on the left is, uh, that's a, a stocked rainbow trout. Um, so they, they, they do get quite large if, if the opportunities present themselves. Um, and on the right is our uh, release um, out of a truck at Bolane Lake um, showing fish coming out of the tube. It's always pretty fun to see. Yeah. yeah. So, are there any questions? Who is Ruth Burnett? Why does she have a fish hatchery named after her? So Ruth Burnett was um, a longtime Fairbanks resident and she was, uh, um, I believe she was a borough mayor for a while. Um, and she, the facility is named after her is she was an aide to Senator Stevens. And she actually um, was very instrumental in securing the first funding for design and construction of the hatchery. Um, most states have um, some sort of federal hatchery system. Alaska is unique in that we don't. Um, there's one small research facility down in southeast, but other than that, the federal government doesn't operate um, hatcheries within the state. She used that as leverage to say, hey, Alaska could use some funding for hatcheries. Um, so sh she helped um, secure federal funding for the facility. Is every lake uh, stocked every year, or is it, is it alternating? Most lakes are stocked every year, but there are some lakes that are stocked on, on an every other year basis. Um, typically, those are the very remote, like the aerial lakes that don't get a lot of fishing pressure. Um, they're stocked every other year, but most of the lakes are stocked every year. Is this the farthest north country? I believe it is. In the U.S.? In the, definitely in the U.S. <laughs> if it was the furthest north hatchery. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant on that because I don't quite have my geography down. There's <coughs> some hatcheries in Canada that are um, a little further. They're pretty close to where we are, so I don't know if we quite get that furthest north, but definitely for the U.S., yes. <laughs> yes? When, when you stock a lake, what percentage of the fish get caught, and what percent disappear to other means? Um, you know, that I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know how you do the research on that. Yeah, I don't know how you would measure that either. It, it'd be pretty tough to, to be able to keep track of, of what disappear and, and what stay, so. But you were saying like a five-year lifetime for a Rainbows and stuff. Mm -hmm. So if nobody fished that lake, they'd all be dead in five years. Yes. Don't they reproduce? Um, they do not. Our rainbows and um, the rainbows, Arctic char and Arctic grayling, are all um, what are called triploid fish. They're sterile, so they cannot reproduce. Um, the reason we do that is because we don't want those fish to move or impact wild populations. Um, that's one of the, the key components to our program is to not negatively impact wild um, stock. So those fish are kept from reproducing because we want to control where they go and, and if there's an impact in five years, that population isn't there anymore and, and can be effectively removed from the landscape. Um, the triploidy process, um, people ask about that. Um, just a real quick summary of that because there's some misinformation about that out there. Um, what we do is we either use a pressure shock or a temperature shock. And um, what that does, without getting too complex in the biology, when a, when a fish egg is fertilized, there's actually three sets of chromosomes in there upon fertilization. The pressure shock or the temperature shock keeps one of those sets from being ejected out of the cell. Um, so we're not adding anything. We're not changing the genetics of the fish in any way. We're just keeping that extra set of chromosomes from being removed from the cell. That causes it to be a triploid and sterile. What would be the uh, minimum criteria for a weight to be stopped and be very efficient? Um, like, like, has to be at least two acres? Or that's a good question. I, I don't think uh, we look at a variety of, of 
combinations we will do if we're evaluating a new lake. We will do a survey looking at water quality, will it overwinter, things like that. Um, so oftentimes really very small lakes won't have a suitable water quality. You'll have things like muskeg drainages or something that really shift a pH. Um, it depends on the lake and the water body. I, well, how deep is it? Um, that probably up here it have to be deeper because of thermal tolerances. Um, the lake, if they're shallow, will heat up, um, and then the summertime would be a, a lethal level. So we don't necessarily have a hard criteria for depth, but it, but we do go out and say July or August and evaluate a lake and say. I was thinking the other way. The cold would be a problem. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so that's we do evaluate um, for winter kill. Um, that's not an absolute no, but we will. Um, some lakes all the organic debris in the water um, rots over the winter and it consumes all the oxygen. Um, so it's not, when people say winter kill, it's not that the lake freeze is solid, it's just that it uses up all the oxygen and, and can suffocate the fish that way. Yes? How many employees do you have, full-time or part-time? We have four full-time employees, uh, four full-time fish culture staff, and then one maintenance staff for the building. Um, and then we hire one um, summer seasonal. And that's staffed, um, we have staff there seven days a week. To my understanding that after the clear hatchery was closed, that the, the, uh, a number of lakes weren't stocked for years, and Fish and Game still had their signs that said these lakes were stocked by the Elastic Department of Fish and Game, which you it's kind of, if that's true, I think it's pretty rude because I know a lot of people were fishing and it wakes up along the sea sideway and there's nothing in them. And I think that they should have put a cover over the sign or something so people would be aware of that. I can't speak to what happened after clear closed because that was before I was around and working for Fish and Game. Um, we, we stock the Steese Highway Ponds right now and I believe <laughs> Um, any of those signs, we have made an effort in recent years to make sure our signage is accurate and correct. Um, so, so, like I said, I, if you had a specific lake, um, I'm not sure about, um, but I, I think we have made an effort in, in recent years to make sure that the signages are correct. Um, annually, we're replacing signs because people tear them down or shoot them or um, things like that. So, um, we do try and make an effort to make sure that the signage is accurate so people know um, which lakes um, are stocked and which aren't. Yes. Fish and game or anybody studying the lakes that you have been stocking that previous to this time had no fish and now for the last 20 some odd years have had fish. Is anyone doing studies of other critter activity in the area that would be drawn by fishing other than humans? Um, that I couldn't say. Um, I'm not aware of any projects like that that are going on. Um, we do, like I said, we do periodic evaluations of the lakes that we stock. Um, I think they're um, done on a rotating basis. We've got 116 different lakes we stock right now, so it can't be done annually or anything like that. Um, but I'm not aware of any like eco, ecosystem level evaluations that are done. Um, one of the things that we try not to do is stock on any wild fish. Um, so again, limiting our, our impacts to wild populations, so we try not to, to do that. Are you open to uh, someone, say, with a mine pond that within reasons, reasonably clean, coming down and getting a bucket to throw in for the local kids? Um, there's, there's criteria that have to be met. Um, one of them, um, and this stops 90% of all requests, it has to have public access. Um, well, that I understand. Yeah. But that would be acceptable sometimes. Um, but most line ponds are borderline. But yeah, it depends. Again, there's an evaluation process. We look at public access. We, we look at evaluations um, and, and do that um, before we would look at it. Down and get a no, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, down at the bottom of Tina Ridge Road, there's a big project going on to replace culverts, and it's my understanding is to try and reestablish a natural drainage. I think it's called Cripple Creek. And I thought one of the ultimate goals was if that all works, how we're going to use it. It takes for that to settle out to uh, restock it as a salmon stream, and that got all screwed up during the gold rush and that kind of thing. 
Uh, do you have any familiarity with that project? I, I do not. I can't speak to that project. Are there plans to expand going to more lakes or different areas? Or? Um, every year there's always a couple proposals. Um, this year we stocked um, three new lakes that we hadn't stocked previously. Um, so we do look at new locations and things like that. Right now for some species our rainbow trout production is pretty close to capacity. Um, so we have to look at is the new lake offering additional opportunity that isn't met already. Um, um, sometimes there are um, and we've, we've added some lakes to our, like I said, program this three years. We're not actively looking to massively expand at this point in time, um, but, but through the statewide stocking plan, if you have locations that you think would be a great suitable lake and can offer some opportunity that doesn't exist elsewhere, um, put them in. Um, it, it's one of those processes that I think a lot of people get a little bit jaded with public interaction with government agencies about does this really matter? Um, and I will say that it does matter. Um, we have stock lakes um, because people write in and support it. Um, so, so we are receptive. I'm not saying that whatever you suggest is going to happen, um, but I will promise you that it is evaluated and we do look at things um, if, if that's within our capability. How far up the LA Highway do we have no gas homes? We don't. Um, we still, yeah, homeless is as far north as we go in the LA. They charge money to go into that park. <coughs> okay with the fact that fish stocking is supposed to be for open to the public? It is because it's considered a state park, um, so that means the, the public access is a state policy, but it's also tied to our funding. Um, the, the federal government program requires um, anything, any fish that are produced with that funding mechanism has to be available to the public, and they do consider, um, a, they don't consider a campground fee or an access fee at a state campground okay. um, as uh, a public, they consider that public property and public access. Everybody has the right to treat it equally and just yeah. versus a private pond where somebody would put a gate up and say you can't access it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well thank you ever so much.